We're hearing never before disclosed details about what led to the killing of a business owner in Lawrence. The prison sentenced against a 19 year old woman charged with killing a Lawrence man. Lynn was very open about killing Sasko. He says she told him she wanted to know what it was like to kill someone, and she planned Sasko's murder five days before she killed him. Ever heard of a revenge story so jaw dropping it'll leave you stunned? That's Sarah McClint's story, and we're about to uncover every shocking detail. This documentary unveils Sarah McClint's bold act of revenge against a 52 year old man. It's a roller coaster ride of mystery and crime, but we won't spoil the story just yet. Stick around to find out the reasons behind Sarah's revenge. You won't want to miss the thrilling twists and turns that make this case so interesting. On January 17, 2014, the police arrived at Hal Sasko's Lawrence house and found his dead body. Sasko had zip ties around his hands. There were a jumble of other zip ties by his feet, some cut while others were used. The cops found stains of blood above Sasko's head as well as blood drops and patterns all around the house. There were beer cans around and three of them had sleeping pill leftovers in them. Sleeping pills were found in a high amount in Sasko's body after a toxicological analysis. During the trial, a forensic pathologist stated that Sasko had no defense wounds and that he died from stabbing and slicing cuts to his neck. In her detailed proof, the pathologist described the horrific details of Sasko's injuries. To sum up, she sawed or cut through most of the soft tissues around Sasko's spine along with severing his neck. The police grew suspicious that McClinton had been kidnapped after finding her mobile phone on the kitchen counter and realizing that Sasko's car and McClinton's dog were gone. At the time, the police started a statewide search for McClinton and put Sasko's car in alert. The police found out that on January 14, 2014, Sasko's car drove into the Kansas Turnpike early in the morning and drove off of it close to the Oklahoma border later that same day. After that, McClint's family informed the police that she'd try to contact her grandmother through phone calls that came from convenience stores on the Kansas-Texas route. The calls were made by McClint alone, according to video surveillance, and the police then confirmed McClint as a person of interest in the murder. A week or so later, the National Park Service informed the Lawrence police that McClint was being held close to Miami, Florida. On January 26, 2014, McClinton was interviewed in Florida by a Lawrence police officer for around three hours. According to the detective's statement during the trial, McClinton said that she was aware that the interview was regarding Sasko's death and that she had killed Sasko to experience what it was like to kill someone. She went into detail about the plans she had made before killing Sasko, like faking an excuse for absence from work and using the excuse of death in the family to buy herself some extra time to leave town. McClinton revealed that she smashed up some sleeping pills and mixed them into Sasko's beer for the actual murder. Later, Sasko got to his feet, staggered, and collapsed onto the ground face down. While Sasko was unconscious, McClinton zip tied his wrists and ankles. However, as she was tying Sasko's wrists, he woke up, said something, and then fell back asleep. While McClinton admitted to the detective that she was having second thoughts at the time, the detective claimed that McClinton had stepped aside herself that she was going to kill Mr. Sasko and went on to bind his wrists. McClinton went to her bedroom to get a hunting knife and sat very close to Sasko's hand. She slid the knife into his neck until it struck something, which she assumed to be the carpet, after searching for Sasko's carotid artery. After that, she pulled the knife towards her to let it cut his neck while using both of her hands in a sawing motion. McClinton admitted to the detective that she had considered killing someone for the previous two years and that she had resigned on Mr. Sasko within five days before the murder. McClinton filed her defense of mental illness or defect after her arrest for planned first-degree murder. She claimed to have multiple personality disorder, also known as dissociative identity disorder or DID. In her statement, Dr. Marilyn Hutchinson, the defense's expert witness, clarified that the term system of Sarah was not in common nomenclature for people who work with DID. In 2015, Gonzalez McClinton was found guilty of first-degree murder by a jury but they were unaware of the months of abuse that led her to her horrific act. After the jury's verdict during the sentencing phase, the district court finally sentenced McClinton to 50 years in prison. The advocates are now trying in vain to right what they see as injustice by urging the governor to give her mercy to free her from prison. 
The main points of the clemency application center on Sasko's upbringing of Sarah starting at age 14, including the financial and psychological tricks used to keep her at work. It has come to light that Sasko, who was 52 years old at the time of his death, was already training twin sisters who were 16 years old. After the murder, the police and media quickly attacked Sarah, calling her a psychopath and a gold digger, while raising Sasko to the status of a martyred saint. The truth about what happened is rarely heard, and it's time for it to be revealed. Let's go back in time a little to know about McClin and Sasko Met. Sarah was raised in Topeka, Kansas and was born on July 9, 1994. She was homeschooled for many years, which left her naive and protected. A neighbor molested her after her parents divorced. She was traumatized by this and started to slip out of her house at odd hours to drown her sorrows in alcohol. Sarah was yet a kind person. She once saved a harmed horse and was always watching after her younger brother who was disabled. But the struggling teenager had a rough ride from fate. She was viciously attacked at the age of 15 by an older male friend who also went on to rape her and burn her with cigarettes after pushing her into a coffee table and breaking it. Sarah has felt unwanted and out of place since her parents' divorce. She frantically looked for a way out because she didn't feel welcome or at ease living with her family anymore. And then, Gonzalez McClin accepted Sasko's offer to move into his Lawrence house when she completed her Topeka High School studies a year ahead of time. He was 50, she was 17. Three years before, she started working for Sasko at his Topeka CC's Pizza Place, which is how they first got acquainted. Terry David, who oversaw one of Harold's restaurants, said that his boss asked him to hire young, attractive girls only. Terry was furious when the female staff members urged him to keep an eye out for Harold. Even after Sarah went on to other jobs, he stayed in touch. Sasko was aware of the difficulties in her relationship with her parents. He was aware that she had suffered burns from cigarettes after being raped by a man. She ended up with depression and post-traumatic stress disorder after making a suicide attempt. Sasko assured her he would look after her. I had no idea what was in store for me when I moved into that house, Gonzalez McClin said. He didn't seem like a father figure to me. I just had no idea. Alcohol and marijuana were freely available in the alleged shelter. There was also access to cocaine and ecstasy. She paid for her food and was charged rent by Sasko. As Gonzalez McClin put it, he slowly took control over nearly everything that I did. After around six months of living together, he expressed his love for Gonzalez McClin. Although she claimed to have shut it down, he went on with his unpleasant ways. After a while, he started to insist on having sex to be with him. Sasko took her paychecks and told her she had unpaid bills for things like petrol, phone bills, car repairs, and other dues. He warned her that if she left, he would wipe out her credit and make it impossible for her to rent a place to live or get a car. He also said he would sue her. He warned her that she would be homeless. Later, Sasko boasted to police about how wonderful it was to have an 18-year-old, according to family and friends. However, he told Gonzalez McClin that he didn't think she was attractive enough. He put pressure on her to undergo a nose job and then added the $6,000 bill to the amount she had paid to get off his hold. Men don't like women with flat chests, he told her. Her figure needed to be curvier. The doctor claimed she was too young for breast augmentation surgery, even though he wanted her to go through it. Instead, he made arrangements for her to receive buttocks implants. Though she felt helpless, she refused. He increased her bill by $10,000. The amount of her most recent Bad Bath & Beyond paycheck was $265.56. Sarah's colleagues at Bad Bath & Beyond described her as quiet reserved and a fashion model with a 5'8 height and 120 pounds of weight. She was quick to clarify that Harold was her stepfather when they tried to eavesdrop on their conversation. However, everyone had darker suspicions. Even though their living situation was known to everyone, no one took action to help Sarah. Gonzalez McClin later admitted to a psychologist that when Sasko needed sex, she would drink herself half unconscious. He held her arms if she tried to get away. She said to the psychologist, I would get as drunk as I could just to lay there. She estimated that over 10 months, he had raped her two, three times a week. It was then claimed by the prosecution that all of this was voluntary. 
However, imagine this from her point of view. Would you choose to have sex with a man in his 50s if he had been a homeless, penniless teenager who had to do so to survive? Gonzalez McClint separated herself from reality by the end of December 2013. She googled phrases like, why do I think so differently? I feel like a caged animal at this point and it's making me crazy, she texted her sister. After all this, she was too ashamed to answer questions from her coworkers and go back to work. So instead, she spent her day sleeping off on the couch while high and thinking how she would get out of her financial trap. A month or two ahead of the murder, Greg Kelly, CC's Pizza's manager, informed police he went to his uncle's house and was shocked to see a dead rabbit in a bowl in the fridge. Gonzalez McClain had bought the rabbit for a nearby pet shop, stated in a waiver that she would take care of it, and then killed and skinned the animal with a knife. She took the rabbit's fur from the garbage and showed Kelly how to pierce the rabbit's neck with a knife. She had given the method some thought. She said that she was doing this to develop her ability to self-survive. With plants to cook and have it the next day, the rabbit was marinating. Kelly thought, this chick has problems. By all accounts, Sarah was mentally and financially troubled and she was emotionally and psychologically worn out. The time leading up to the murder, according to her, was in clear and felt like dreams. It's important to know about the neurological effects of sexual abuse, according to Sharon Sullivan, a professor at Washburn University and an expert on human trafficking. According to Sullivan, the brain's decision-making center shuts down and the survival brain takes over. Advocates believe that by raising the public's awareness of human trafficking cases, judges, family members, and law enforcement will be better able to understand women like Gonzalez McClinton. According to Sullivan, Gonzalez McClinton's brain was not even fully shaped by her situation. She was trapped. She was not aware that she had options. Gonzalez McClinton claimed she was unable to find a healthy way to cope with the abuse. As a child, Gonzalez McClinton had been raped by a neighbor and the rape at age 16, according to Hutchinson's report, was very traumatic. She thought of killing the rapist and herself. She could not help but feel humiliated. Sasko's abuse made the trauma worse. Gonzalez McClint felt that she would either have to murder him or commit suicide. Hutchinson pointed out that her thinking might have been affected by a change in depressive medication. Sasko texted Gonzalez McClint early on January 14, 2014, apologizing for trying to have another sexual contact with her. However, around 5.15 that evening, he texted her to ask her to put the beer in the fridge. She was aware of the fact she would be raped if he was drinking. Gonzalez McClin later shared with Hutchinson that killing Sasko was like her first time standing in the sunlight. Sasko used to favor girls who had experienced abuse, assault, abandonment, problems with the law, or huge reports about their moms, according to a confidential police report. Imagine how much harm would have been avoided if officials had been aware of that before Gonzalez McClin moved in with him and had taken the necessary steps. In 2021, Susan Valdez, the newly elected district attorney for Douglas County, struck a huge agreement. Gonzalez McClain gave up the right to appeal in return for having her sentence reduced. However, there's no assurance a parole board will grant her release from custody before her death. They see her exactly as she appeared during her 2015 trial, not as a teenage victim who was sexually assaulted since she was a young child and later turned into a Barbie doll by her former employer, but rather as a person who had killed to feel the thrill of killing. Although Valdez openly supported the plea deal, he felt Gonzalez McClin should be set free. Gonzalez McClin was denied an in-person interview by state penal officials who justified their denial by stating that it would cause problems for the prison staff and that access to the agency is restricted to stories in appropriate topics. Gonzalez McClin, surrounded by other prisoners, was instead forced to reply to sensitive queries over the phone by jail officials. She was anxious to share her experience because this was her first time speaking with a reporter. I've never talked about this with anyone outside of lawyers and psychologists, like not even my own family, Gonzalez McClin stated. But I just feel like it's time also. I feel like it has been just so hard to open up about because it does still hold some kind of power over me. The 28-year-old Gonzalez McClin said that her ugly buttock implants serve as a constant reminder of the emotional and physical torture she suffered at the hands of Sasko.
The story peeled back the layers of Sarah McLean's story. From her journey for revenge to the reasons that made her commit such a crime will linger in our minds. Thanks for watching. Sometimes, reality is more unbelievable than fiction.